Thank you, Fanny, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aditya Shankar. And as she mentioned, this is joint work with Steve Seitz at the University of Washington in Seattle. So to define the problem, uh, the question is we have a room such as this. This is a common like living or dining room. It has some tables, chairs, uh, of course, walls, doors, windows, some artwork. Um, and the output we want is essentially a 3D CAD model that represents this room. Um, and you know, it sort of represents the furniture, the walls, and the artwork in a way that's semantic, so you can actually rearrange and move things around. So you know, of course, this has many interesting applications. Some of the obvious ones are real estate. Uh, if you want to buy or sell your house, it'll be nice to have a 3D model. Uh, and there's also other interior design applications like remodeling or virtual furniture rearrangement, which these kind of models can enable. And going forward, I think it'll be really interesting to have a semantic CAD model of your home for various augmented reality and virtual reality applications as well. So there's a slew of tools out there right now, and most of them are on the web or on desktop that do this kind of problem, where the user can go in and draw their walls and pick the furniture and sort of create this 3D model. And this is just sort of a, maybe about 20% of them uh, visualized here. However, there's one problem. So if your garage looks anything like mine, you first have to find the measuring tape, you know, to like kind of measure the dimensions of the walls. And oh, actually, there it is. So let's grab that. And uh, we'll grab probably a pen uh, and a notepad as well to like measure the, uh, to record the dimensions. The next step is to actually like sit and measure the walls and uh, place, you know, position the furniture and note it down in your notepad. And then move on to these sort of somewhat complex user interfaces that usually exist on the web or desktop. Um, and are pretty time consuming. And in fact, uh, for more advanced tools like you know, AutoCAD, for instance, there's actually full books on how to learn the interfaces. Um, so not really accessible to novice users. The next stage is select furnitures uh, from large catalogs. And this is a home styler, which is a tool that allows you to select you know, uh, furniture from various online catalogs. And this can also be time consuming if you're trying to find the exact right match. So the, the, the key is the creating models this way is frustrating, time consuming, and not very much fun. So our approach instead is to use an emerging class of devices known as 3D aware mobile devices, and also employ an in situ user, uh, that's me in fact, uh, in order to achieve similar end results uh, that are both faster, more accurate, and also easier. Um, so for those who don't know about 3D aware mobile devices, a quick introduction. So this is actually a device called Google Tango, and it's a, a phone that can track itself in six degrees of freedom uh, in 3D space. And with that, uh, you can sort of add augmented content into the scene. So for instance, for instance, over here, I'm having adding a table and chair into an empty room. Uh, but this device also has a depth camera that can sense the depth and distance of every point from the camera as well. Um, and this is a tablet or a phone that you can buy right now in the market. So given this device, uh, let's take a quick look at our interface. So to capture walls, all the user needs to do is look around the room and tap the wall corners. And as they go, it sort of visualizes this grid uh, of the walls being captured. And to capture furniture, the user essentially aims the device at uh, a dominant plane in the furniture. For example, for this chair, it's the seat. Then they stand back and take a quick image of the furniture uh, when it's in the view. And within a few seconds, a list of results is returned, and the best matching CAD model is placed into the scene, sort of overlaid over the actual piece of furniture. So this is the essential workflow, and the user repeats this for every item in the scene. So this is another chair, for example, and so on and so forth. They can also mark uh, structural ob objects like windows and doors by marking the top right and bottom left corners in this sort of fairly intuitive way that defines the plane of selection. They then define uh, to the system whether if it's a door, window, or artwork. In this case, it's a window, and the same sort of list of results is returned, um, and the user can select the best matching model uh, from the list. So uh, same for doors, top right, bottom left. Define the door and pick the best one. So you kind of interactively construct this model. Uh, and this is a look at the end result. So that was a real scene in the back, and this is an augmented reality overlay uh, of the generated CAD model, which took in the order of five or eight minutes. So again, as you can see, doors, windows, uh, couches, tables, and artwork. So kind of the things that you're interested in, um, you know, in applications like this. Um, so really quickly, I want to put my work um, in some context with related research. 
Um, so we talked briefly about virtual home design software and the issues there about like measurement and reconstruction. Um, there's also fully automatic methods, uh, both from image and depth-based methods. Um, and the, the drawback with these generally is that they're not semantic. You get these large models, which are essentially polygons, and you go and do some extra work to like, extract semantics. And also for these methods, um, if you come back to your desktop and you do hours of processing and you find there's a hole, you actually have to go back to the scene um, and recapture data as well. So the in-situ method sort of helps alleviate these problems. There has been some work on interactive semantic modeling, uh, in particular these two papers. Uh, the first one is actually also sort of you capture the data once and you go to desktop to do the interactive modeling where you use CAD models to reconstruct the scene. Uh, and the second one uses a, uh, an iPad and is not 3D aware, so it also limits the amount of uh, modeling you can do. And there's more detailed comparisons to these work in our paper. So in order to solve this problem, we make some observations and simplifying assumptions. Uh, the first one is that most furniture items can be well approximated by furniture models in ShapeNet. Uh, and for those who don't know, ShapeNet is a collection of 3D models scraped from the internet. Um, and for instance, it has 220,000 uh, classified models of real world objects that you know, users on SketchUp and so forth have made, spending a lot of time and effort. So can we repurpose these to um, model our home? Um, the second assumption is similar to the, the first work presented in this session, is that we try to understand the world based on planes. Um, and in particular, like most furniture types tend to have either vertical or horizontal like dominant planes. So for instance, uh, a chair to, pump, to perform its function of seating has like a, a plane as a seat. A table has a tabletop and a bed has a mattress and so forth. And these planes actually uniquely define the position, orientation, and scale of these objects as well. Um, so to just delve on that a little bit further, given the scene, if you can extract the planar surface of the table, and given a 3D model from a database, if we can extract the same planar surface, by aligning these two surfaces, we can probably uh, estimate or at least come up with an initial guess for the position, orientation, and scale of the 3D model. Uh, and similarly for chairs. The next assumption is that doors and windows are bounded by axis-aligned rectangles, and which is true for most cases, for most doors and windows. And also that the walls are vertical um, and uh, essentially our planar, uh, which is another exemption for our wall capture system. Uh, and these tend to hold true in a majority of homes. So based on these assumptions and uh, observations, we designed the following system architecture. I won't go to, into it in full detail, but I will talk about a few components. Uh, the first is the um, furniture surface capture uh, process, uh, and here's a quick demo of that. So again, all you need to do is aim the device at the plane and tap and the plane is automatically segmented, and you can see this sort of orange box previewing your current selection. And when you're satisfied with the selection, you tap to confirm it, and it becomes a green solid uh, structure to indicate that that's the plane that's been selected. For larger objects such as tables that don't fit in within the field of view, you can sort of additively create the surface uh, with multiple taps. And as you can see, it's a pretty good segmentation of that surface. So how does this work? Uh, again, given a scene, remember our 3D aware mobile device also has a depth camera. So it's actually showering the scene in infrared dots. Um, we have the user actually just tap a seed point um, in this depth map. So for instance, if they tap the top of the table, we can filter the points based on the planarity and extract the points that belong to that particular plane. Now you have sort of this uh, noisy planar representation, but we can clean that up using a rotating calipers algorithm. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm. It runs in real time and extracts a nice non-axis aligned bounding box for the surface. Um, it's actually also a fairly robust to clutter, so since we are not considering points above or below the plane, um, it does well if there's even objects, phones, uh, you know, desktop, or whatever on the scene as well. Um, so really interesting and cool algorithm from uh, Shamos in 78. So once we have the surface, uh, we then take an image of the object, and with that image, we actually send it to a server. And the server is running several parallel convolutional neural networks um, that are trained on the ShapeNet 3D model database. Uh, and just for some context, we are training our chair uh, classifier in about 6,000 chairs and 8,000 tables, so we have a lot of variety to cover a large number of furniture types, especially common ones which are more uh, freely available online. Um, so this is a diagram actually from Lee et al.'s work, and the idea is that given just a, a single image uh, in any orientation of a chair, it can retrieve the top K models um, from the database. 
So the deep learning system and this, you know, this whole conferences on this kind of stuff uh, is very good at retrieval and simplifying the task of object selection, but it's somewhat still less reliable uh, for determining exact position, orientation, and scale. And also, uh, the top K results are close, but sometimes they're not exactly correct, um, as shown in this example. So I take a picture of this chair, and then uh, when I like, wait for the results, I actually get something that looks nothing like the chair in the scene. And this is where the institute user can really be useful, so they can go in and correct mistakes of the system and also help retrain the system if needed. So in this case, they pick the chair that's the you know, sort of best matching model from the result, which is actually further, much further down. It's like the 10th result or so. Um, so the user can provide some really useful input uh, at this stage. Now finally, from the server, once we have a model that we are satisfied with, how do we place this in the scene? Uh, we devise a placement algorithm that, again, works really quickly uh, in real time. And how it works is that you take the matching 3D model from the server, and you essentially sample it by ray casting. So you fire a bunch of rays into the virtual scene, like a depth camera would into the real scene, and you come up with a point cloud uh, or a depth map, if you will, of the 3D model. And then you essentially run the same pipeline. You run the rotating calipers algorithm, you extract the plane, uh, and this, in this case, automatically. Um, and then you essentially, given the plane in the model and given the plane in the scene, you can do the same alignment. Aligning two planes is almost trivial. Um, and in this case, we can estimate the position of the CAD model in the real scene. Uh, and this visualization is essentially uh, in the blue points are depth points, uh, and the green points are points in the model that have been explained by the depth map, and the red points are points that have not been explained by the depth map. Uh, for instance, these handles actually don't show up on the depth sensor. That's why they now haven't been explained. But you can kind of tell that this is a good fit. However, planes do have some amount of rotational ambiguity. So for these examples, uh, you know, these chairs are offset by 90 degrees from the model. And as you can see, uh, you know, there's a lot of points in the model that are not being explained uh, by the real scene. So we have a scoring function that we define that can discard uh, incorrect alignments such as this. And here are a couple of examples of a correct alignment where most of the points in the CAD model have been explained by the depth map. And finally, once a user is satisfied uh, with the position of the object, they can just press a button to confirm its placement. So that was our uh, rough interface and uh, sort of technical details. Uh, and to evaluate if this actually works, we ran a simple user study. Uh, and the idea was to capture a 3D model of this study room uh, that consisted of one desk, four distinct chairs, a window, and a door. And this is an example output from one of the users who had used our system for the first time. So we ran a 10 by 2 within subjects user study and compared it to uh, HomeStyler, which is a popular tool for this task that uh, people use online. So we found that our uh, system performs better, both in terms of task time uh, and placement error. So it's much faster to use, uh, even if you include or exclude measurement time uh, for the desktop method. And, um, it also has less placement error, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is a top-down view of the scene, rendered as a point cloud. Uh, and the green lines are the ground truth positions of the furniture objects. And the red lines are uh, positions captured by both our system and HomeStyler. And as you can see, both in terms of shape and centroid, uh, we do perform much better um, than the XHU method. We also collected some qualitative feedback from users. Uh, so we sort of, on various axes, asked if our system was much lower or much higher in demand, and uh, green indicating much lower. So in things like mental, physical, and temporal demand, uh, our system was uh, deemed to be much uh, lower than the desktop system, which is encouraging. Uh, we collected some quotes from the users. Uh, for instance, it was a much smoother process, and I was more confident in the result. Uh, but we also got some interesting feedback which will uh, inform future work. For instance, capturing large surfaces was frustrating and inconvenient. And holding the tango for several minutes in front of you can be tiring. Um, so it works, I think, well for the study setup. Does it work in other scenes? Uh, so to present some more general scenes, we um, show some visual results in the paper. Um, so on the left, we have a real scene. And on the right, we have the captured model. Uh, in this model, we have some artwork as well, and there's more details in the paper about how we capture that. It's very similar to doors and windows. Here's another scene. It's a living room with uh, different kinds of couches, tables, chairs, and doors and windows, and the corresponding captured model. Uh, and for more, more visual results and to see if it generalizes to bedrooms and dining tables and so forth, uh, you can please see our paper. So at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge some limitations of this approach. Uh, so the plane assumption works really well for a large number of furniture types uh, that exist commonly, but it also fails and, or is too strong for some furniture types. For instance, plants don't really have a planar surface to define their position. 
uh, lamps don't either, or these curved chairs. So an interesting avenue of future work is to extend uh, our method to work for these kind of objects as well. At the moment, we model about six categories of objects, uh, but there's you know, probably like several thousand different categories that exist in homes, appliances, bathroom fixtures, cabinetry, and so forth. Um, so there's some promise that we can uh, ex uh, ex extend onto this domain as well. And for future work, I think capturing the layout and structure and position of objects in the room is interesting, but uh, capturing the lighting and appearance of objects uh, could also be really cool. And actually walking around your home and creating a full floor reconstruction somewhat like this, this is actually artist rendering. But being able to do this with your phone in a few minutes, I think would be a really powerful uh, direction for future work. And finally, remember the users were getting tired holding the device in front of them. So I think a solution to that is to use head-mounted devices, such as the HoloLens. Um, and this essentially uh, overlays augmented reality content on top of your own field of view, uh, so it's much more convenient. And actually, we have a small proof of concept that was captured through the HoloLens. So this is actually the view that I'm seeing through my eyes, or through the user's eyes in this case. Uh, and it works something like this. So as you look around the room, uh, the system, again, has a depth map and sort of detects chairs and also like rotates, orients, and uh, positions them uh, correctly in the scene. And the user sort of just does a tap gesture to place them. Uh, and for the purposes of this example, we only uh, work on chairs. But you can imagine extending this to other objects as well with the techniques defined in this talk. Uh, but there is some promise here that you know, with this in-situ in interactive uh, approach, we can create like, quick and useful models of our homes. Um, so to conclude, uh, we use a 3D-aware mobile device and an in-situ user uh, to create semantic indoor 3D models. Um, it works well for many common furniture types and different kinds of scenes. It seems to be faster, more accurate, and easier than traditional desktop tools that are ex-situ. And finally, it's a promising direction uh, for an emerging class of 3D-aware devices. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Wolfgang Stürzling and Simon Fraser University. Nice work. Uh, your rooms look so sterile. There is no clutter in there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you comment on that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, for the purposes of demonstration, it's sort of aesthetically more pleasing to have cleaner rooms. Uh, and I didn't include, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's like a cop out answer, but I didn't include uh, examples in the talk with clutter in there. Uh, but actually, since we're extracting, uh, so this user seeds a point and has this sort of preview. Um, of the plane, uh, and we are extracting points that lie only on that sort of seed point, we, it automatically eliminates you know, things that are on top or below objects. So if the table is fully cluttered and you cannot really see any of the points besides the seed point, then yes, it will fail. But if there's any part of the table that's visible, like the edges, for instance, that agree with the initial starting point, then it should work just fine. And um, there's other examples in the paper that explore this. Uh, hey, Aditya. Uh, hey, you know me. Uh, I'm Ariel from uh, UCSD, the design lab. I had a question about your study. Could you go real quick to the top-down view, that slide? Um, what I wanted to understand was that we were judging, you know, the, you know, how much better this tool is than HomeStyler by how accurately the placements were. And I was wondering, in HomeStyler, is the user responsible for placing the geometry, or is it automated by the tool? Because I, I feel like if the users are placing it wrong, you know, that's their problem. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think that's a good question. And the users are indeed responsible for placing the geometry. Um, and there's two ways of doing it. One is to sort of approximately like use reference images or just turn your head back to your room and place it, which is kind of what people did here. Or the other one is to actually physically measure them out. Uh, but the measurement time is so prohibitive that uh, we're already like almost twice as fast as the comparable system. So we just had users kind of place them. So it does include the error from the user, which is fairly significant. Got it's it. not automatic. Yeah. I mean, I think your way is way better. I just want to see where the error was Sure. From. Thanks for Thanks. the clarification. Uh, really nice work. I want to ask that if you want to extend your system to the really creative architectural models and buildings that people are building nowadays, how are you going to do that? Um, do you mean like buildings that are not sort of yeah. well-defined? Like uh, yeah, I think, I mean, again, that's an interesting direction for future work. Um, I think the real great thing about the 3D-aware devices is that they have a depth camera. Um, so you can actually sense the shapes and structures of you know, any kind of object, that, as long as it reflects infrared light. 
Um, one of the challenges there, though, is that um, to have this work in real time, the way our system does, uh, is more difficult for like completely freeform objects. So I think having that sort of reducing the amount of time that it does, um, it takes to model those kind of uh, scenes would be critical. But for now, like simpler planar scenes uh, just works really fast, and I think that's kind of what we were going for in this paper. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>